guys, um, this is Ms. Gephardt, Ms. Ramoni, and we're going to be doing the ocean resources notes. So please make sure you have your worksheet out and you're ready to take some notes. Our essential question, so make sure that by the end of this presentation you know what the resources that the ocean provides for us, as well as what happens when we deplete these resources. So let's take a look at what does the ocean supply for us. First of all, it's a huge supplier of food, of medicine, minerals, and energy resources. So the minerals that we're looking at would be salt, copper, iron. Those are all mined in the oceans. A third of the world's table salt, that's sodium chloride, the stuff you put on your food, comes from the oceans. Additionally, there's an enormous amount of fish and shellfish harvested every year. We get, obviously, lots and lots of fish to eat from the oceans. Whether you realize it or not, you do consume seaweed every day, and you can see seaweed there. Mrs. Gebhardt, what do you mean we consume seaweed every day? It's in all the stuff that we eat, like, for example, ice cream, yogurt, things like that. We wow. Phytoplankton is a very important resource that produces a lot of oxygen in the air. So phytoplankton is a plant-like thing not really a plant, but it acts sort of like a plant. It produces a lot of oxygen for us. These would be phytoplankton. And additionally, we use a lot of the chemicals from ocean organisms in medicines that help us to be healthy. All right, so when we think about um, the stuff that the ocean provides, one thing is commercial fishing. So we're not just thinking about this guy right here hanging out with a fishing pole. We're talking about big involvement, huge nets that you've probably seen if you watch any kind of shows like on Deadliest Catch or something like that. They have big nets that they take in, lots more than just a fish. All right, sonar, satellites, these are gonna be ways, and especially when I'm a fishing vessel, so here's my little fishing vessel, boop, right here, okay? They're gonna detect the fish based on sonar. So we gotta think about um, sonar and satellite usage. All it's gonna do is it's gonna provide us where there's a large concentration of fish. So if I'm a fisherman and I'm making my money fishing, I wanna get the biggest catch. All right, overfishing. So this can happen when obviously we take more fish than they're able to make more of themselves, okay? And it's hard for us to know, right, Mr. Mahoney? Yeah. How many fish there are because it's hard to see fish. They're in the ocean. We don't count fish like we would a deer or anything else. But I'm hungry. I want seafood for dinner. Yes, you might want seafood for dinner, but we have to consider that they don't, just because we can't see them, we don't necessarily pay attention to their actual numbers. So that's something that can happen. We can easily overfish things to extinction. And that affects the entire ecosystem, not just that one population of fish, because you have to think about what they feed on and what feeds on them as well. Exactly. All right, bycatch. So this happens, and we'll get to this picture down here in a second. But bycatch happens when we are out fishing for one particular fish. Okay, maybe I'm looking for a marlin. And I put out my nets, and I got my marlin, but then there's all these other organisms. So we might get dolphins in there, we could get turtles in there, you see sharks. They didn't know that the net was there and they ended up in there. And unfortunately, by the time we get that net out, usually they've either drowned or they're to the point of dying. And they're considered bycatch. So it was not what we intended to catch, but we ended up catching it anyway. And you might say, wait a minute, they drowned, but they're fish. Well, not everything can just live completely underwater all the time because turtles, sharks, whales, lots of those types of things need to come to the surface to breathe. And they need to keep the water moving in their gills to let the oxygen actually get in them. All right, aquaculture, so it's literally, you gotta think of it like it is farming. I mean, you're making more fish, so we can see all of these areas, we've got concentrations of fish. Well, why is that a bad thing, Mrs. Gephardt? We're sitting here in the ocean. This is the bad thing, the poo-poo. The fish have all this poo-poo, but it's in one spot, so it's highly concentrated, so this is a lot of really pollution that the ocean is having to deal with. Yes, all these fish, and fish could be in the ocean, but we're putting a high concentration in a small area. So we have to be careful of that when we have aquaculture. Okay, so now let's talk about some more of the non-living resources that the oceans provide for us. Uh, and one in particular is salt. We get a lot of salt from the oceans. So desalination is the process of taking salt out of ocean water. D as in un or non, taking it out. Sal as in salt, ocean process, whatever. Why can't I drink some ocean water though, Mr. Mahoney? It's a whole lot of water there. Why can't I drink that? You absolutely can drink ocean water. 
but it Sweet. doesn't mean it's good for you. Drinking ocean water dehydrates you because you have all of the salt that's actually soaking up more water out of yourself than it actually is providing you with the water that your body needs. So this just shows the desalination process. You don't need to be real specific about knowing how that all works, but know that we take salt out of water. Another non-living thing that we get is oil and gas from the oceans. We drill and pump from the continental shelf. So remember the continental shelf is relatively near to the shoreline and it's relatively flat and that's where we drill for oil and gas. The uh, offshore, Ill offshore oil drilling is a heated, de he hotly debated topic because of the recent oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Here you can see all of this is oil. That's nasty. It's not supposed to be there. It's all from the bottom of the ocean. So we need to be very careful about what we are drilling. And if we see here, oh, I'm sorry. Ah! It's got part. Your computer doesn't like me. So we can see this is an offshore oil rig, okay? And these are out in the ocean, it's offshore oil rig, okay? And this platform right here is gonna drill on down and it's gonna pull that oil out. You can see we have a nice little shell logo. So BP is gonna have what Shell has when they all have them. They're gonna take this oil and they're gonna move it inland and they're gonna change it up so we can use it in our cars. All right, so let's start thinking about human impact on the oceans. Uh, especially when we start looking at pollution. Okay, so this is the pollution we see. So obviously any kind of solid waste. You see plastic garbage, you know, a plastic bottle or whatever, that would be solid waste. Okay, and then unfortunately these sea animals sometimes think it's food and they ingest it and they can die or they get things wrapped around their necks and they choke or they lose flippers or something like that, which is, you know, unfortunate to the poor little sea creatures because we obviously don't want to hurt them. Now this big old disgusting looking thing is actually a whole bunch of water bottles. And there, this is real. It's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. If you want to Google it at home, you can. Um, you, you might see something in class about it. But it's literally a spot in the ocean where all of this plastic has come together because of currents. So literally, it's like a field of plastic bottles. It's multiple like square miles of plastic. And it's all busted up plastic pieces but the plastic does not biodegrade, so it all just sort of, as the Skephart said, sort of gets washed into one area because of ocean currents, and it just sits there. Now the, the obvious question is, well can't we just come in and clean it up, Mr. Mahoney? Why can't I just come through and clean all this up and recycle it? What's the problem? It is so massive. It is more than you can even realize, and for the most part, they're just tiny little pieces of plastic, so it's not like you could just take a big net and swoosh all of it up. You have to, it, it's much, much more plastic than you even realize. And we have to think too, we continue to, in, even in, out at Carmel, go outside in the blacktop and see how much plastic you find. Because eventually, we're going to replace anything we did get rid of. Yep. Alright, so in addition to the pollution that we do see, the plastic stuff primarily, there's also pollution we don't see. Chemical pollutants, nuclear wastes, and heavy metals like mercury are found in the ocean. They're not naturally found there, but they're found there because of us. Mercury can be found in fish, and that's why, for example, pregnant ladies are not supposed to eat fish because that can be transferred to the baby, and that's very, very, very bad. Um, human waste fertilizers and sewage have created dead zones in the ocean. So, when we talk about human waste, fertilizers, sewage, those types of things, just like we talked about with fresh water, where increases in nutrients cause algae increases, which causes bacteria to start eating them, blocks out the sunlight. Eutrophication can kill a lake, just like this, causes a dead zone in the ocean because they use up all of the oxygen. So you can see very clearly right here, healthy water over here, this is the dead zone. And obviously it's not a perfectly straight line, but it is relatively straight where you have all of that pollution that's uh, causing this dead zone. So if I have a fishy coming this way, he's not really going to want to be over here. 
because there's nothing that's going to help him out. So he's going to turn himself around and move on. They would be able to detect that that oxygen is not quite there. Sorry, I'm in the shot. But keep that in mind because it is something that it's like us walking into a room and there's very little oxygen or none at all. You won't want to be there very long. So it's a, a hence the name dead zone. If I walked into a room and all of the gases in the room were, for example, methane instead of oxygen, I would go, woo, and turn right back around. So keep that in mind if you were a little fish, same, same issue would come up for you. All right, so prevention. How can we prevent some of these bad things from happening? What happens when we deplete the resources? How do we fix it? First, a reduction in bans on chemical dumping. We need to prevent those things from actually getting into the water system so that we don't have to try to figure out ways to undo the bad things that we've done. we got to think about how we properly dispose of our household chemicals. So you can't just take bleach and dump it down your drain, or you can't take certain chemicals and just dump it down the drain. They actually tell you how to properly dispose of it because we know if you think about Nemo, all drains lead to the ocean. At some point in time, we might get to the ocean. So we have to be able to get rid of this stuff properly. Also, by picking up after yourself and encouraging others to pick up after themselves. If there's trash, make sure that you look around and say, oops, I left this, I don't want to contribute to that, so take care of your own. If everybody takes care of their own, it'll be a whole lot better off. And that brings us back to our essential questions. So now you should be able to say, what are the resources that the ocean provides for humans? Thank you, Vanna. And what happens when ocean resources are depleted? And if you don't know the answer, you can ask Vanna, or you can ask Mr. Mahoney. Thank you. You're welcome.